Okay, um, our class in Prophets, the full name is the Message of the Prophets. We're going to deal with the, the context and content of the information in the, the prophetic books of the Old Testament. I'll talk about that as we go along. But this is the outline, which is also on that reading schedule. Today we're going to talk about the place of the prophets, just basic introduction and background. I need to give you a historical context because the, pro the prophetic writings of the Old Testament are critically linked to the history of the people of the Old Testament. If you don't have some sense of the historical context, then most of what you're going to hear about this or read in the prophets is not going to make a lot of sense to you because the God ordained and sent the prophets of the Old Testament to address specific situations. Uh, geopolitical realities, problems that were being uh, occurring to the Hebrew people. And so we're going to talk about that today, what the general context is. Next week, we're going to start talking about the major prophets. And I'll describe to you later what a major prophet is as opposed to a minor prophet. doesn't mean one is more important than the other. That's not the definition, but we'll talk about that. Next week, we'll introduce the major prophets, and we'll start uh, with the first of the major prophets, which is Isaiah. One of the longest of the Old Testament books, 66 chapters. Week three, we'll look at the prophet Jeremiah and the book of Lamentations. Lamentations is not technically a prophetic book, but Jeremiah wrote the book of Lamentations, which is a lament. It's a, an expression of grief over the destruction and fall of Jerusalem. And so in that, in that regard, the content, it's as though the book of Jeremiah is Jeremiah's warning about what God will do if the Israelites do not repent. Um, and then, actually, the, the, the people of Judah. Israelite's a generic word, but we'll talk about the fact there were two kingdoms at that point. Um, to the people of Judah, and then Lamentations is his expression of grief when the city um, and the nation of Judah is actually destroyed. So even though it's not a prophetic book, it's linked in there, so we're going to study it with this. Week four, the prophets Ezekiel and Daniel. And again, Daniel is not according to the Jews at least, is not a prophetic book, but it is listed as a prophetic book in the Christian um, canon. I'll talk about that. Then week five, we'll talk about the book of the twelve, the minor prophets as we call them. There are twelve minor prophets, and we'll start uh, with a general uh, overview, and then look at Hosea, Joel, and Amos. Week six, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. And by the time the class is over, you'll be able to pronounce all of those names. Okay? <laughs> And then week seven, the post-exilic prophets, that is the prophets who prophesied after the Babylonian exile of the, of the Jewish people. Uh, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Malachi was the last of the Old Testament prophets. The next prophet after Malachi was John the Baptist. And so we've got about a 450 year gap there, almost 500 years. And then the message of the prophets as a concluding um, week eight, for an hour, and then the second hour of the last week, we will uh, have the final exam, which you're all going to take, right? You're all going to be excited about it. It'll be really fun. Okay. I want to start now. Any questions about that? If you haven't been in the classes before, if you ever have any questions about anything, something I'm not clear about, or some further explanation you need, please ask questions. This is not just me talking, although it's mostly me talking, because I've got to get through the content. But please raise your hand or call out you know, my name or somebody's name you know, and, and get my attention. And I'll be happy to answer any questions as we go along. All right. Why study the Old Testament? There is a, a real, um, a, a dangerous and I believe ungodly tendency among many Christians today to think that the Old Testament was for the Jews. Is this on? It's on. Okay. Uh, that the Old Testament is for the Jews and the New Testament is for Christians and we don't really need to worry about the Old Testament. Nothing could be further than the, from the truth. The Old Testament is as much the Word of God as the New Testament is. The New Testament, while it introduced the doctrine, the, the uh, covenant of grace, that's what testament means, it's Old Testament and New Testament literally mean the Old Covenant and New Covenant. While the New Covenant fulfills and completes the Old Covenant, you cannot really understand the New Testament. You cannot really understand the mission and ministry of Jesus Christ unless you know something about the Old Testament. Everything in the New Testament is a fulfillment of something in the Old Testament. Um, and if you don't believe that, read the New Testament and see how often it is that either Jesus and the Gospels, or later on, Stephen and Peter on several occasions, and Paul over and over again, when they are talking about who Jesus is and why he came, they talk about it in terms of that being a fulfillment of the covenant promise that God made in the Old Testament. 
If you do not study the Old Testament, then you are at best half of an, a, a scholar of the New Testament. Okay? Anybody ever tells you we don't really need the Old Testament? You know, pray for them. And if necessary, <laughs> condemn them in public. Because that simply is not of God. I, I, I mentioned this before to some of you who are in the other Old Testament classes who have heard me or have heard me preach on the Old Testament. I was a visiting uh, preacher at a church that had had the same minister for 11 years. And when I finished my first sermon there, I preached the Old Testament. And when I finished, several people came up to me and said, we've been here for 11 years. That's the first sermon we have ever heard from the Old Testament because the previous minister here did not believe in preaching the Old Testament. And I said that he did not know what God desires for ministry. Okay, sorry, but I'm not going to pull any punches about that. So, we study the Old Testament. We specifically study it because whenever the New Testament talks about scriptures, with one exception in 2 Peter, every time the New Testament says scriptures, it means the Old Testament. The New Testament hadn't been written yet. At least it hadn't been written and accepted as the, the, the canon, that is the divinely ordained instruction for us. So when you read scripture in the New Testament, when Jesus or the apostles refer to scripture, they're referring to the Old Testament. A second reason we study the Old Testament is, as I said, it's part of God's inspired revelation to us. It is part of God's Word. Two-thirds of God's written revelation to humanity is the Old Testament. We cannot discard that. Third, as I said, the Old Testament is foundational to our understanding. You cannot understand what the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ means as a fulfillment of God's promise without the Old Testament. The Old Testament is immensely practical. It gives us very clear guidelines. I'm going to talk a little bit later today about there are three primary messages, especially of the prophetic books of the Old Testament. And at least two of them are as applicable to us today as they were to the Israelites when God gave that, them those messages through the prophets. And then finally, the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ. Now, um, I need to insert a caution here. I believe we need to read the Old Testament for its own sake. There is a great deal for all these other reasons that God desires for us to learn and grow in and understand of Him in the Old Testament by it, as it is. It also points us to Jesus Christ and gives us an understanding. Uh, there's so much through, especially the prophetic books, Isaiah, Jeremiah. You know, Isaiah gets quoted more at Christmas time than the Gospels do. All of the stuff about uh, 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 and Easter as well. But a you know a, a virgin will be you know will become pregnant and have a child and on and on and on all of this uh, prophecy about the coming of the Messiah that we find in the Old Testament Jesus Christ quoted the Old Testament and especially the prophets over and over and over again and so there clearly is a support and a fulfillment that we gain in our understanding of the New Testament when we study the Old Testament. But we also have to study it for its own sake and understand what God was saying to the Hebrew people when it was actually written. But the Old Testament, especially the Old Testament prophetic books, create a very crucial bridge, I believe, between the overall message of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, last term we studied the Pentateuch. Um, our, our Old Testament class last term was the first five books of the Old Testament. Pentateuch means five books or five part book. That's the Torah, that's the law of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Well, the next book is Joshua. Joshua is not one of the prophetic books, according to the Christian canon. Why are we dealing with the prophets now? Because I believe the prophets, the prophetic writings, um, and we'll I'll explain all those breakdowns of what's in what list later, um, it, it really is a crucial kind of platform or foundation for understanding a lot of other things. Next term... We will pick up our last Old Testament class, which will be the uh, history and writings. So it will be from Joshua uh, through the historical writings, uh, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, uh, 1 and 2 Chronicles. We will also look at the Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Job, which are the writings. Okay? But um, I wanted to go ahead and get into the, to the prophets at this point in our course of study because I believe that understanding them and what they say is helpful to a lot of other things that we will pick up later, including in the history books and writings, okay? Any question about that? Well, you guys are easy. The biggest reason, I think, to that I would say to study the Old Testament comes to us very simply from Peter. In 2 Peter, he says, 
Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Just so you understand, I believe that this is God's inspired instruction to us. This is not just a human book. This is not like any other book. Okay? Um, it's a whole library of books, but more than that, this is God's instruction to us. It is the, in this book, God has proven that he cares enough about us to not have been silent or to have left us uh, wandering around not understanding uh, who we are or who God is or how those things are supposed to fit together. Because that's how I describe what the Bible's for. The Bible tells us who God is, the Bible tells us who we are, and the Bible tells us how we and God are supposed to relate to one another. That, to me, is a summary of what this book is about. And it is inspired by God, especially the prophetic writings that we're talking about now. Um, we can quote Peter as saying God has inspired those for our benefit and our sake. Okay? Questions? I want to give you two different ways of looking at Scripture right now, as again, as introduction. Um, the traditional Jewish Bible which the Hebrew Bible, which we call the Old Testament. Our Old Testament is exactly the same as the Hebrew Bible. Now, that's, that might be hard to understand because the Hebrew Bible has 24 books. The Christian Old Testament <coughs> canon has 39 books. 24, 39. But the difference is simply the way they break it up. It's exactly the same content. The Christian canon, we... Um, I'll talk about that in a second. The, the Hebrew, uh, put it this way, the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament, but in the Hebrew Bible, it's broken up in 24 books in three sections. Those sections are the Law, or Torah, Pentateuch is the Greek word, five books that we studied last term. The second group is called the Prophets, or Nevaim in Hebrew. There are eight books in that. Now, that's not the same prophet the same list of prophets we're going to talk about. I'll explain that. The third grouping is the writings, or the ketuvim, and there are 11 books in that. So the law, Torah, the prophets, Nevaim, and the writings, ketuvim, if you take those three Hebrew words, Torah, Nevaim, Ketaim, and you put them together as an acronym, you get Tanakh. Tanakh is the word used for the Hebrew Bible in Hebrew. It's not really a word, it's an acronym. And it is made up of Torah, Nevaim, Ketuvim, Tanakh. They sometimes also will refer to the Hebrew Bible as the Mikra, which means that which is read. This is how the Jews uh, structure and, and see the Hebrew Bible. Now, when I first started teaching this class, when I taught a survey class, I taught it according to this outline. I did three sections, the writings, the, the, uh, the Torah, the Nevaim, and Ketuvim. Uh, I'm not doing that in this, in this class and the next one because the resources that you get in English don't line up that way. Because the same books, the same 24 books in the Hebrew Bible turn into 39 books in four sections in the Christian canon. The difference is how we break it up. For instance, we have 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, 1st and 2nd Samuel. The Hebrew Bible has all of those each as one book. There's the book of Kings, the book of Samuel, the book of Chronicles. In addition, the Hebrew Bible has what's called the Book of the Twelve, which I've already referred to. The Book of the Twelve, we call the Minor Prophets, and we break them all up from Hosea to Malachi. We break up the, the Minor Prophets, and they're all together in one book in Hebrew, which kind of makes sense, I'll explain later. But in, uh, in the traditional Protestant structure, I say Protestant because the Catholics include a few other things, I remember. I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> um, the traditional Protestant structure takes, the, the first part is exactly the same, the Law of Moses, the Torah, same five books. Then we talk about the history books, which start with Joshua and go through Esther. Joshua, 1st and 2nd first 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, those clearly are history of the, of the Hebrew people. And we actually call them history books instead of prophetic books. And then we talk about the books of wisdom which are Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, etc., Ecclesiastes. Then we talk about, at that point, the books of prophecy, not the same list as the eight prophets in the Hebrew Bible. We talk about Isaiah through Malachi, 
and often those are broken up as the major prophets, Isaiah through Daniel, okay, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, and then the minor prophets, Hosea through Malachi, the twelve. The reason why some are called major prophets and some are called minor prophets has nothing to do with importance. It has entirely to do with length. You'd be shocked at how often decisions are made about what to call things or how to orient them in the Bible based upon length. For instance, the Bible as we have it is not in chronological order, neither New Testament nor Old Testament. Uh, frequently it's put in order of length. That's why the major prophets come first, because they're longer. The minor prophets, some of which are less than one short chapter, are put later. In the New Testament, uh, you get the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then you get Acts, the story of the church, which will be tomorrow. Come tomorrow for the book of Acts. Then you get Romans, right? Paul's first book, Romans. Romans was not the first book Paul wrote. Galatians was the first book Paul wrote, and then he wrote First and Second Thessalonians. The reason why Romans comes first in the New Testament letters of Paul is because it's the longest, and it goes down to the shortest. And then you get what's called the Catholic epistles or the universal epistles, the ones not written by Paul, and then Revelation. Okay? So they're not in order by chronology. They're in order of length. Now, I don't know what silly man made that up. You notice I'm blaming on men, not women. It wasn't a woman that made that dumb decision. But once it was decided and they started printing all the books that way, it's pretty hard to change that. You can get a chronological Bible, which will list both Old Testament and New Testament in chronological order if you wish. And there are some advantages to studying them. But, for our sake, we have in the prophets, Isaiah um, is the first of the major prophets, Isaiah through Daniel. And again, Daniel is not counted as a prophetic book in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. They don't call that a prophet, prophetic book, but we do. Daniel is kind of an anomaly, partly prophecy, <laughs> partly apocalyptic. We'll discuss that as we go on. See, I've got all these teasers. I can't tell you everything at one time, no matter how fast I talk. So I have to sort of say, we'll get to that later, fairly often, when we get started. And then the minor prophets, the twelve, Hosea through Malachi. Okay? Is that clear, the difference between the way that the Jewish people line up the books in their Bible, and how they, how they label them, and then the Protestant? Again, I say Protestant as opposed to Catholic, because the Catholic and Orthodox both add extra books that neither Jews nor Protestants accept which are the books of the Apocrypha. We're not going to get into that uh, for this conversation. If you want to know about that, you can go back and view some of the videotapes or talk to me about it later. But there are books that, that neither Jews nor Protestants believe are part of Scripture, and yet the Catholics do. And mostly the Catholics do because when the Protestant Reformation happened and the Protestants said, we don't accept these books, you know, um, First and Second Maccabees and Bell and the Dragon and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when the Protestants said, we don't accept those as Scripture, the Catholics had never thought they were fully scripture anyway, and, but as, a, rebel, as a, a way to stick it to the Protestants, they said, yes they are, they're just as much Bible as the rest of it, and so that's how they became part of the Catholic Bible. So, get that church history. Okay, um, <coughs> let me do mention the uniqueness of Daniel, because again, we have Daniel listed in our study um, as a major prophet which he is listed as that in the Christian canon. But Daniel is a very special category. He's listed in the writings group in the Hebrew Bible. We look at Daniel and see that there are some parts of it which are typical of a prophetic book, having to do with, um, with being critical of the sin of the people and calling them to repentance. There's also prophetic aspects which are future telling, you know, predictive prophecy, we call it. Uh, but for the most part, we have to say that Daniel, while it has elements of a prophetic book, is actually apocalyptic. An apocalyptic book is one in which there is a, um, a revelation is given to a person, in this case Daniel, from God, that sometimes through an intermediary like an angel, but that has to do with an understanding of God's plan for the future. In a frequently in a very colorful, symbolic kind of way. The book of Daniel has uh, two major sections which have to do with visions that Daniel had, each of which represents some future event that's to occur, particularly having to do with future uh, kingdoms that will come into power. Um, and so this was a divine uh, revelation that God gave, and it's that kind of apocalyptic literature. We get a little bit of that in Zechariah. Certainly we get that in Revelation. The book of Daniel has a lot, has 
in some ways more to do with the book of Revelation than it does with some of the other prophetic books. But it still makes more sense to put it there than anywhere else. We will study that in more detail when we actually get to Daniel. Okay. So, I just mentioned pr predictive prophecy. A lot of people believe that a prophet is someone who tells the future. That is not what a prophet is. Not in a biblical sense. A prophet is one who speaks for God and who interprets God's will to the people, which may or may not involve telling the future. Okay? Um, a prophet speaks the word of God to the people. That's why throughout the Old Testament you have prophetic characters, prophets, saying, Thus saith the Lord, this is God's word to you. You get people like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel saying, This is the message God has for you people. Listen, it, again, there are some times, like in Daniel, where it involves some predictive prophecy, meaning a prediction of something that is going to happen in the future that God has given foreknowledge of in order for that to be part of the message. But that's not as often what's going on as it's simply somebody saying, this is God's word for you, this is God's message for you, this is what God wants you to hear. That's what a prophet is. So when we talk about the prophetic books of the Bible, we are talking about, um, as well as some of the, not prophetic books, some of the history books, uh, but we're talking about individuals whom God has called up and ordained and equipped and inspired to give his message to the people. Particular messages at particular times for particular reasons, but always God's word to them. That's what a prophet is. That's what we're talking about when we talk about the prophetic books. And because Daniel has some aspects of that, that's why we are counting Daniel as one of the prophetic books. Okay? Question about that? Are you fair with what we mean when we say prophet? Okay. Um, now, the very first true prophet, according to Scripture, was Moses. Now, Abraham is referred in one place as a prophet because he spoke God's word, but... It was a different kind of situation. When we talk about a prophet speaking, prophet speaking the word of God, we're talking about someone who is given the responsibility to communicate to other people what God wants them to hear. And that really wasn't the case with Abraham. Abraham received God's word and he shared it with his family, you know, in terms of, of uh, as he, first with Sarah and then with Isaac, and, you know, and that, that was communicated. But... He did not have, Abraham did not have the call of a prophet in terms of communicating to a whole people. Moses was the first one for whom that was true. Moses was called to communicate to the Israelites while they were in captivity, that God desired to bring them out of captivity, and then all the way through the exodus out of Egypt into the, into the, the desert of Sinai, and then the giving of the law. The giving of the law through Moses to the Hebrew people is the ultimate example of God saying, this is my word for you in great detail. And it became the Mosaic Law, the law that God gave through Moses at Mount Sinai, the Jewish law as we know it, became the ultimate uh, foundation for what it meant for the Jewish people to be a people. And so that was definitely, clearly God's word to them. So Moses is seen as the first true prophet and actually the prototype of the prophets that would come later. In Deuteronomy 18, verse 17 and following, it says, The Lord said, I will raise up for them a prophet like you, Moses. From among their brothers, I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything I command you, or command him. Um, Moses was the first example of God choosing a person and speaking into that person so they then could repeat God's word to the people. And he promised Moses that he would continue to do that so that there would always be a spokesperson for him amongst the Jewish people. Now, one of the reasons why, uh, when you study the New Testament, why John the Baptist was so, um, there was such a big deal about John the Baptist, people going out from Jerusalem to see him, you know, huge crowds, and, and he became a, quite famous, is because it had been, as I said, almost 500 years since the last Old Testament prophet. And the people had spent almost, a, you know, a half a millennium, almost 500 years, saying, where is God? Why hasn't he spoken to us? Because God, after Malachi, had not appointed a new prophet up until John. And John, John's word of prophecy was, I baptize, you know, repent from your sins and be baptized as a sign of your cleansing, but I baptize you with water, but the one coming after you, after me, will baptize with the Holy Spirit in the fire. So John had the usual prophetic testimony of repent, God saying, repent. That's probably, you know, number one on the hit list for prophetic messages throughout all of the prophets. 
But then it went on further to say, there's another one coming. I am only here to prepare the way for that one. Okay? And so Moses, the first true prophet. Then Samuel, and I'm going to give you a, a quick history of the Hebrew people here in a minute to give you a background for this. Samuel has been called the last of the judges and the first of the prophets. Now, again, not counting Moses. After the people get into the promised land, Joshua, the generation of Joshua, they conquer most of the land, and the next generation sort of gets lazy and decides they don't want to have to fight to take over the rest of the land like God told them to. And so they go through a very difficult period, the period of the judges, in which they get themselves in one, one mess after another with one group of people after the other. The Philistines and various other Canaanite tribes are oppressing them, and God will send forward a judge, they're called. Samson was one of those best-known judges. Uh, Deborah, a woman who was a judge, who's also identified as a prophet, by the way, but uh, as having prophetic gifts. But the last of the judges was Samuel, who was also the first of the true Old Testament prophets after Moses. Now, Samuel is the prophet whom God sent to find the first king of Israel, Saul. Samuel was sent on a mission to find Saul and anoint him as the first king. When Saul disobeyed God, and God decided to replace him, it was Samuel, the prophet Samuel, that God sent to find Saul's replacement, who was King David. So Saul was critical in terms of that transition from the time of the judges, which was very difficult and kind of chaotic, to the united monarchy under first Saul and then David and then Solomon. Okay, So um, Samuel was critical in terms of the first in the true sort of model of Old Testament prophets after Moses. But there were other Old Testament prophets, or at least people who were referred to as having prophetic, prophetic gifts. Uh, example, the prophets who were called prophets prior to Samuel, you have Enoch. I mentioned Abraham is called a prophet at one point, although again, this is a different kind of prophet. Moses we talked about. Miriam, who is the sister of Moses, who, who prophesied before the Lord. Now, most of these folks, uh, with the exception of Moses, would have kind of a one-off kind of prophetic gift. That was not, this was not their full-time job. You know, they, they, got, they got contract work periodically as a, as a prophet, uh, but would not full-time prophets in the way that an Isaiah or an Ezekiel or a Jeremiah would be, or even Samuel for that matter. So Miriam, Moses' sister, then we have Eldad, Medad, and the Seventy, all of whom were chosen for specific kind of prophetic uh, messages. And then Deborah, I mentioned, who was one of the uh, judges, but also a prophetess. Now, by the way, these overheads, sometimes I'll go through this quickly, but all of the scripture verses and stuff, I'm not looking them all up. All of this will be online. So all of this will be available as a resource to you if you want to go back and look up particular stuff about Deborah, for instance. Um, and then I mentioned that Samuel comes along, and Samuel is the one that God chose and sent to find the first king of Israel, Saul, and then after Saul, David. So we then have the prophets during what's called the combined monarchy, where all of the different tribes of Israel are combined under one king. First Saul, then David, and then Solomon, David's son. And those prophets include Samuel, first and foremost, Gad uh, was a prophet, and then Nathan. Nathan is the one that confronted David after his adultery and uh, with Bathsheba. And after he then had Bathsheba's husband killed, it was Nathan, the prophet, that confronted David with his sin. Um, Ahijah, some of these names you will never have heard because they're mentioned like once. Ahijah, Heman, Jaduthan, and Edo are all prophets that occur in Kings and Chronicles in the historic part. Um, then we get into the, uh, begin to get more into the period we're talking about here. These are prophets that were prophets during the divided monarchy. Okay, quick history. You've got the, the combined monarchy happened under Saul, when all of the tribes had one king. And then David, the great king. And then Solomon. Solomon was fine to start off, and then because he married foreign women, those foreign women convinced Solomon to let them worship their own local gods, their Canaanite gods, some god other than the one true god, Yahweh. Well, Solomon not only allowed them to do it, but he started encouraging the whole nation of Israel to do it. He set up temples to worship the, the Baals and the Asherah and others. Solomon even set up um, sites for child sacrifice, because some of these Canaanite, Canaanite gods required child sacrifice. Uh, 
God had promised Solomon, he promised David first and then promised Solomon that you will always be my king. I, I will not get rid of you like I had to get rid of Saul, the, the first king. So he allowed Solomon to live out his life as king, but upon Solomon's death, the judgment against Solomon for his, um, his worshiping other gods and, allowed, and encouraging others to was that the kingdom gets split in two. In the southern kingdom, they call Judah, and it still has Jerusalem as its capital. In the northern kingdom, it's called Israel. Very confusing. So the nation, the whole combined nation of Israel broke up in two, and one half of it was called Israel, the king, northern kingdom of Israel, and the southern kingdom of Judah. Well, during that divided monarchy, between that period and the rise of the Assyrians that we're going to talk about, we have a number of prophets that come along very briefly. Uh, Shemaiah, Ahijah, Edo, Hanani, Jehu. Um, there's actually a, a rock band called Drives Like Jehu because Jehu, Jehu is a maniacal you know, uh, chariot driver. Okay? Um, so there's a group called Drives Like Jehu. And then two that you certainly will have heard of, Elijah and Elisha. Then Micaiah, Jehaziel, Eliezer, uh, Zechariah, you've heard of them. And then they talk in First and Second Kings about unnamed prophets. Now, one of the reasons why these are important is there has up until this time been no prophetic books written. Elijah and Elisha, as important as they were, did not write any books. These are called the, um, the non-literary prophets. Because they didn't write anything. They sometimes, the, the Hebrew people sometimes call them the former prophets because they came before the writing of the prophetic books. So as important as Elijah, Elijah was so important that he got bodily assumed into heaven. He didn't die. We had that scripture reading on Sunday as part of, our, part of the lectionary, if you remember it. Um, and then Elisha took over from him. Elijah had this the wonderful... Wonderful in terms of the results. Event when uh, so many of the Israelites had turned to for worshiping foreign gods, like the Baals. There were a series of gods called Baal. Um, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who's seen as sort of the consort of Baal, these pagan gods, um, there on Mount Carmel, Elijah gets up there and has it out with these guys. Elijah, one guy against 850. Um, prophets of these foreign gods. And, and Elijah nukes them. <laughs> God nukes them through Elijah. This wonderful scene where he, he says, okay, let's set up two altars, one for you and one for, you know, one for your Baals and one for God. They sacrifice, they, they cut bulls up and put them on the altar, and then he says, okay, call down fire from your God to burn up your sacrifice. And the prophets of Baal dance around all day, slashing their wrists and banging cymbals and swords and and screaming out to God to their gods and you know send fire and everything else and the whole time I love this because it's like the first example in history where you have trash talk because Elijah's standing over the whole time going what's wrong guys is your God on vacation maybe he's asleep maybe if you get a little louder you can wake him up you know and Elijah's trash talking these guys the whole time well when they're finally done trying and nothing has happened Elijah says Okay, I want you to take water and pour it all over the, the, you know, the sacrificial meat in the altar. And then he says, okay, do it again. Do it until the trough that they had dug around the altar is completely filled with water. Absolutely soaked. And then Elijah, rather than trying to make a lot of noise or bang on cymbals or whatever, he goes, God, show them. Bang! Lightning from heaven consumes the entire altar and the, the, uh, the uh, oxen that had been sacrificed, even burning the water in the trough around them. Okay? And then the people rise up and, and kill the prophets of Baal. Well, then Elijah has to run for it because uh, Ahab and Jezebel, the kings of the north, were real keen on that. Okay? So, anyway, that's, that's the degree of importance that Elijah and Elisha have. And yet... There are no books of Elijah or Elisha. They were pre-literary. They were of the former prophets before the, the prophetic books were written down. Okay? Um, any question about that? Yes? Um, you mentioned a prophet, Asaph. Was he one of the authors of the Psalms? Was that the um, same Asaph? Yes, I believe he was, as a matter of fact, now that you mention it. 
because there are several psalms that are attributed yeah, to David. I was just wondering if it was the same guy. I think it is. It's not that common a name, so um, we'll go on that on that print, on that idea until we find out otherwise. Um, okay, before I get into now the latter prophets, as the Hebrews call them, or the literary prophets, I want to give you a little background in terms of some of the history of scholarship. One of the tasks that we have in these classes in theology is we have to have some context for what kind of discussion and discourse and academic study is done on these things because I can teach you all of this. You go out here and you start reading another book about this or you're looking at something online and they start quoting liberal scholars on some of this stuff which sound very different than what I'm saying. I need to give you some context in order for you to understand this as to how different scholars have addressed these things differently. I need to give you a little background on some of the scholarship that's been done on the prophetic books of the Old Testament. It's kind of generally the Old Testament, but specifically the prophetic books over the last 150 years or so. Okay? Um, the first thing we have to acknowledge is the fact that, um, and I don't think I want to go, no, okay, I'll wait on that. Um, the, the prophetic books of the Bible are um, somewhat vague in terms of identifying who wrote them down. Now, understand the difference. I said who wrote them down, not who the prophet was that received the message of God. Because usually, in the prophetic books, it will say something like this. Like, um, and, and these, this is the word that Yahweh gave to Joel. Or, this is the vision and ministry that the Lord gave to Isaiah. It doesn't say... I'm Isaiah, and I'm writing this down for you. So the authorship, in terms, when I say authorship, who actually wrote it down is vague. The most conservative scholars anywhere have to recognize that, that it's not real clear. So the question comes up, and, and particularly because you, you have to understand that the prophetic books of the Old Testament, most of them are anthologies. They're collections. Some of it is narrative. Some of it's historical. Some of it is prophetic visions. A lot of it, probably the largest single section of the prophetic books, is poetry. And so these books, it's not, you know, they're not kind of like the book of Acts. You know, start at a point, follow a history, get to a point at the end. They're combinations of a lot of different visions, poetry, narrative, history put together. And so it raises questions about how did all of this different kind of stuff get put together? And... As a conservative, I'm, I'm an evangelical. As an evangelical scholar and other evangelical scholars, we look at this and say, since it, the books don't say, I'm Isaiah and I wrote this down. You know, I, Joel, am writing down what God told me to write down. It doesn't say that in the prophetic books. To what extent is it necessary for us to believe that the prophet who heard God's message and communicated that message to the people in the 700s to, to 500s, 400s. Um, how important is it that that same person who received that message and communicated it verbally, and all the prophets were verbal in that regard, is the same one who wrote it down? Right? Let me talk about that for a minute. In the late 19th century, that is late 1800s, liberal, the, the, a huge battle started between liberal and conservative scholars in the, in the area of biblical studies. In fact, in all of academia in the late 19th century, there was a move toward trying to emphasize um, using the scientific method, that is, proof, evidence, in all matter of study, not just in theology or biblical studies. Well, when they began to apply that uh, scientific method, or the idea of evidence being required to believe something's true, when they started applying that to religion and to scripture, they started analyzing scripture apart from any idea that it was divinely inspired. Okay? There was not the assumption on the part of these more liberal scholars in the late 19th century and early 20th century that this was divinely inspired by God and given to these prophets and you just take it on face value. And so they started analyzing the contents and when they did that, their natural tendency was to minimize any idea of divine activity. Scientific method and divine activity are sort of like oil and water. They're both legitimate, but you try to mix them, you got a problem. They don't mix very well. Particularly, we ran into the questions in the prophetic books about whenever there is predictive prophecy, whenever there is prophecy that talks about something that is supposed to have happened later than the writing, obviously the liberal scholars are saying, no, that can't happen. 
The perfect example of that, so you know what I'm talking about, is in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah, the first of the major prophets, 66 books long. Isaiah was probably, of all the literary prophets, the most prominent, the most important one. And probably more quoted by Christians than any of the other prophets as well. Because of all of the both prophetic things about, about the coming of the Messiah and also about some of the Easter sacrifice, like the suffering servant passages, you know, which we see as, as being a predictive prophecy about the nature of Jesus' sacrifice for us. Okay, so you get Isaiah. Um, people don't really have trouble with Isaiah 1 to 39. But when you look at the last half of Isaiah, 40 to 66, three times in the last half of Isaiah, Isaiah mentions by name King Cyrus of Persia. Just so you know, it's Isaiah 44, 28, 45, 1, and 45, 13. He quotes, he mentions by name Cyrus, king of Persia. The reason that's a problem for some people is that Isaiah lived in the 8th century. Cyrus lived in the 6th century, 200 years later. Remember, because we're BC here, we're, it works backwards. Isaiah lived 200 years before somebody that he quotes by name three times. Obviously, the liberal scholars looked at that and said, can't happen. That's not possible. So therefore, somebody else wrote the second half of the book of Isaiah. And you'll find a lot of scholars today will talk about 1st Isaiah and 2nd Isaiah, believing that the prophet Isaiah in the 8th century BC probably did do the first 39 chapters. And at least they were written when he was alive, whether he wrote them down or not. He actually had a secretary named Baruch. We know his name. So probably Baruch wrote them down, but it was when... Uh, I, but they say... The second half of this book was not written by Isaiah. It was written by probably two different people 200 or 300 years later. This is an example where liberal scholarship looks at this and goes, no such thing as a miracle, no such thing as predictive proph prophecy. 200 years before Cyrus lived, Isaiah could not have known his name, so he didn't write this. Well, conservative scholars come back and say, God can do whatever he wants. And predictive prophecy is possible. And it's very possible that Isaiah had a vision of this man Cyrus, who was very important to the Jews. He's the one, the first Persian king uh, who conquered the Babylonians, who let the Jews go back. The whole story of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the city, that happened because Cyrus the Great, the first of the Persian kings that conquered Babylon, let, let the Jews go back. So he's important. That's why he's mentioned three times in Isaiah. So this, this controversy between liberal can't be... Predictive prophecy and conservative and evangelical saying God can do whatever he wants and yes, there is predictive prophecy You know there are times when the future is told in scripture This was just loggerheads from the 19th century up until the mid 20th century at toward the end of the 20th century things changed some The liberal scholars finally started saying okay we will agree with you Oh and one other thing I should say another uh, argument for Isaiah being one book is that Jesus quotes the second half of Isaiah and attributes it to the prophet Isaiah. So did Jesus get it wrong? Okay. For a conservative, that's a big issue. So, late 20th century into the first part, first decade of the 21st century, the liberals changed more toward the middle. They started saying, okay, we now admit that there are some things in, in Isaiah, between the first half and second half of Isaiah, for instance, that are consistent. There are, there are uh, expressions, uh, uses of words, phraseology, that makes it sound like the same person wrote these two. So we'll grant you that. Okay? That was a huge concession. And they then started giving more credit to the original prophets. They started say, giving, saying, okay, we believe that probably Isaiah, who lived in the 8th century, for sure did write, or was there for the writing of the first half of this at least, and then, undoubtedly, he at least left stuff behind that influenced the second half of it. So they're given more credit to the original prophets whose names are on these books. And then finally, the liberal scholars started focusing less on all of the bits and pieces, because they love to slice things up and then criticize, you know, you know about the documentary hypothesis and the Pentateuch we talked about before, where they take the first five books of the Bible and they divide it up so that there are between four and ten different sources. And they'll take one verse and break it up and say that four different people were responsible for writing one verse. And it, it, to the point of it being ridiculous. Okay. They stopped doing that. They stopped trying to slice everything up and then analyze individual pieces. The liberal scholars started saying, maybe we need to pay more attention about the whole book. 
And what does the whole book say and look like? Instead of worrying about all this little tiny detail and arguing about that. So that was the way the liberal scholars moved more toward the middle. The evangelical or conservative scholars also moved more toward the middle, not by giving up any of the authenticity or the credibility of scripture, but instead the evangelicals started uh, recognizing that it's possible there's such a thing as inspired editing. For instance, if, if you believe that Isaiah was the one who received all of the message that's in the book of Isaiah, it doesn't mean that Isaiah had to write it all down. It's possible that Baruch, his secretary, was also inspired by God to write down the message that God had given to Isaiah. There's nothing that doesn't deny the value or the, the credibility or the divine inspiration of Scripture. It's possible to have an inspired editor, too. And that there's nothing in that necessarily uh, problematic. So... The, while they still have major disagreements, the liberal scholars and the, and the conservative evangelical scholars have gotten much closer together in just the last 20 years or so with regard to their interpretation of the prophetic books. And you need to understand that because you'll pick up a book like Brueggemann, who, uh, John, like Brueggemann, who, uh, John's a fan of Brueggemann's. Brueggemann will talk about, in 2nd Isaiah, blah, 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 and you go, 2nd Isaiah? I don't find but one. Well, that's what he's talking about. And you need a little understanding about some of those disagreements that have occurred. But that those things are getting closer together. And with regard to the evangelicals, let me read you a quote here. This is from Mark Boda, an evangelical Old Testament scholar. He says this, It is consistent with an evangelical view of Scripture that close associates of the prophets took the words revealed to the prophets by God and shaped them into a powerful message for later generations to read and profit from. Okay? That doesn't take anything away from the validity of Scripture. One of the other things that, that uh, evangelicals still insist upon very powerfully is that any, any writing down had to happen very close to, either before or very close to the death of the prophets. It's one of the things the liberal scholars will say, okay, this stuff was written down 200 years, 400 years, 600 years afterwards. And, so they're, and, and by saying that, they then, their next statement is always, and so therefore you can't put too much stock in because it was written so much later. No, we don't think so. Evangelicals have maintained that it was these things, even if the, pro, the prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, even if they're not the one that wrote it down, it was written down during their life or very soon after by someone who was trusted and inspired by God. Okay? So that's a little bit of the background in terms of some of the scholarship. We're going to take a break for about nine minutes to back up now and give you a very quick, uh, very quick kind of foundational background of the highlights of Jewish history. Um, you know, the history of the Jewish people in six minutes. Um, <laughs> because, and again, to understand, uh, I want to do a little bit of this sort of generic or general foundation of the Jewish situation, and then I want to talk more specifically about the particular historical context, um, geo geopolitical as much as anything else um, context, that was the basis for the prophetic writings, okay? Um, in about 2090 BC, we believe, and whenever you see a C like that, it means circa, that means best we can tell, is what circa means. It's, it's, it, that's the closest we can get. Around 2090 BC, Abraham receives a call by God and becomes the father of the Hebrew people. Obviously, later on, his name becomes Abraham. Abram means exalted father. Abraham, the name God changed his into, means the father of many. Okay? So that gives you an idea. It was 2,000 years before the time of Jesus that Abram gets called. And then uh, around 1445 to 1405 BC, we have the exodus from Egypt. After the Israelites were put into captivity or slavery in Egypt, God calls Moses to go into Egypt to do battle of sorts with Pharaoh and to get Pharaoh to release the Israelites. Um, they cross out, cross the Red Sea, cross out of captivity, and then at Mount Sinai, God gives the law through Moses, which is the Ten Commandments and all the rest of the 609 commandments of the Old Testament, or the mitzvot, as the Jews would call them. Uh, they spend 40 years wandering around in the desert because of disobedience. Uh, I always say someone is 
Someone once observed that they spent 40 years wandering the desert because they were being led by a man who wouldn't stop and ask for directions. But <laughs> it was actually because the whole generation of adult males had to die from disobedience before they were allowed to go in. And then the entry into the Promised Land. Um, then around 1050 BC, you have the time of the United Monarchy. That is under Saul, David, and Solomon when all of the tribes of Israel were united under one king. And then around 931, that is at the death of Solomon, the kingdom is divided. It's divided between the southern kingdom of Judah, which is ruled by Sol one of Solomon's sons, and the northern kingdom of Israel, which is controlled by um, a pretender to the throne. The significance of that, um, well, well, let me back up and give you a little more background here. Throughout the whole of God's relationship to his people, you can really, um, if you look at the book of Genesis, the core book that kind of lays out the foundation for our understanding of humanity and why we are how we are and how God, what God's plan for us is, um, Genesis 1 and 2 have to do with the creation. Genesis 3 through 11, the book of Genesis, deal with sin, how sin came into the world, the fall, and the separation from God. So those eight chapters, Genesis 3 to 11, actually nine chapters, 3 to 11, deal with the human problem of sin and separation from God, the God uh, with whom we were made to be in a relationship. So that's through 11. Starting in Genesis 12, that's where Abraham gets introduced, actually the end of chapter 11. But Abraham gets introduced, and from chapter 12 of Genesis until the book of Kings, you have God beginning to reveal his plan for how he is going to reconcile humanity back to himself after the fall. So, two chapters of creation, Genesis 1 and 2. Nine chapters of explanation for how sin came into the world and what the consequences were, Genesis 3 to 11. Then Genesis 12 up until through the books of Kings, actually 2 Kings 25, I think, uh, we'd say, is the... Unra unfolding of the story of how God is going to work to call all of humanity, especially starting with his chosen people, the Israelites, back to himself. Now, throughout that, all of that from, you know, from the call of Abraham in Genesis 12 on, all of it is based upon God's covenant call and commitment, first to the Hebrew people, and then the prophets begin to tell us this call is going to be opened up to everybody. When Abram is called, God said, I will bless you, and I will bless all the peoples of the earth through you. Okay? People think that the Old Testament call, the, the call of the Hebrew people is just for the Hebrews. Abraham was told, I'll bless all people through you. Abraham's son Isaac, when the call was renewed to Isaac, the covenant was renewed with Isaac, God said, and I will bless you, and I will bless all the peoples of the earth through you. When Isaac's son Jacob received an affirmation of, of the covenant, God said to Jacob, I will bless you and I will bless all the peoples of the earth through you. So all the way along here, God's covenant commitment to the Israelites always includes very specific and clear statements that God will speak to the whole human race through the Israelites. And the covenant has three, uh, it's a three-part formula, and it's very simple. God's covenant with the Israelites is, I will be your God, that's point number one. I will be your God, special God. Second, you will be my people, my special people. And third, I will dwell in your midst. I will be right there with you. In fact, after the giving of the law in the book of Exodus, or the, the, the whole Mosaic law in the book of Exodus, the Ten Commandments and the rest, the whole rest of Exodus has to do with the building of the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a portable um, shrine, if you will, that God said would be his residence in the midst of the people. And God gave instructions that the 12 tribes of Israel would camp, three on the north, three on the south, three on the east, three on the west, right in the middle of those 12 tribes would be the tabernacle. In the middle of the tabernacle would be the Holy of Holies, uh, where the, the Ark of the Covenant was kept. And that was to be the throne of God. His his place of residence right in their midst. And to demonstrate his, his presence with them, uh, the Israelites saw a cloud of fire at night and a column of, of cloud at day. And always they knew that God was present because of the column of fire and the column of cloud. 
because that meant God is here in your midst. So God's covenant promise to the Israelites was, I will be your God, number one. Two, you will be my people. And three, I will be there in your midst. Now that's kind of a background understanding for the rest of the the um, the rest of what happens. That brings us through the monarchy, you know, through the judges, through the monarchy, all the way up to the time in which God is continuing to unfold His plan despite the unfaithfulness of His people. Okay. Now, um, I mentioned the fact that there is a particular uh, geopolitical meaning. There's a geography associated with this, but there's political stuff. That's the context for the prophets coming. That has to do with the fact that in the 700s BC, that is the 8th century BC, the nation of Assyria had been the first kingdom of Assyria, had been powerful, but they started getting weaker in the 700s. At that time, the um, king of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, Jeroboam II, he was getting more powerful. They, the northern kingdom of Israel was having a good time of it. They, they had a lot of money, and they were beginning to flex their muscles. So Jeroboam, the king of Israel, um, decided he wanted to expand. His successor immediately after that was King uh, Pekah, P-E-K-A-H. King Pekah of the northern kingdom of Israel got together with the king of Syria named Rezin, and they attacked the southern kingdom of Judah. So it's Jews attacking Jews. Northern Kingdom of Israel, along with the Syrians, attacking the Southern Kingdom of Israel, or the, of Judah. The Kingdom of Judah was weaker. This was what's called the Syro-Ephraimite War. I'm sure you all remember that. <laughs> the Syro-Ephraimite War, when the Northern Kingdom of Israel, along with the Syrians, attacked the Southern Kingdom of Israel. Well, the Southern Kingdom was weaker. Or the Southern Kingdom of Judah. I keep saying that. Southern Kingdom of Judah. The southern kingdom of Judah was weaker, and so they called on Assyria, this big power to the north, to come and help them. At that time, um, Syria had a new king, Assyria had a new king that had come along, whose name was, very cool, Tiglath-Pileser III. They had great names back then. In my, in my church history classes, I remember taking like 20 pages of notes on tiglath Pileser III. He was very important. Well, tiglath Pileser III is beginning to re-strengthen the Assyrian Empire, which is called Neo-Assyrian, because remember they declined and now they're back up again. They come down and they help the southern kingdom of Judah. First by sort of struggling around, you know, just sort of pinching <laughs> off the edges of Syria and the northern kingdom of, of Israel. Yes? What would be the equivalent to Assyrian today. Okay, let me go ahead and show you that. Assyrian Empire. This Mediterranean Sea, this is Egypt, this is Israel, this is modern day Turkey, which was known as Asia Minor back then. So this is the Assyrian Empire. It covered all of, eventually, all of Palestine, all of what we know of as Iraq and over into Iran, okay? And north up, you know, almost to the Black Sea, over into Asia Minor, and they conquered all of Egypt. It was a major world empire, okay? Now, that's Assyria. I'm going to show you uh, a little bit more in a second. Um, so the Assyrians come down to help the southern kingdom of Judah, and eventually, through back and forth and back and forth, they end up conquering, completely conquering the northern kingdom of Israel, whose capital was, uh, was at that time in the city of Samaria. You've heard about the Samaritans? The Samaritans during Jesus' time were half Jewish, half something else that the Assyrians had brought in. In 722 BC, the Assyrians completely destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel and destroyed the city of Samaria. So there is no more northern kingdom of Israel. Ten of the twelve tribes of Israel were in the north. You have heard of the lost tribes of Israel? The ten Israeli or Jewish tribes in the northern kingdom of Israel, when they were defeated by Assyria, were annihilated. Assyria would take people off into slavery, forcibly intermarry them with other people, you know, uh, diminish their bloodlines, and bring other people in to live in their land. They did a great job of sort of just wiping them out. Those are the ten lost tribes of Israel. That was in 722, as you can see. But shortly after that, 
Assyria decides that they're also going to try to conquer the southern kingdom of Judah, okay, the other half of Israel. Now, the northern kingdom of Israel had been notoriously um, bad in terms of idolatry and, and bad morality and everything else. But one of the reasons was you've got the northern kingdom of, of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Where's Jerusalem? Southern kingdom. Northern kingdom can't get to Jerusalem. What's in Jerusalem? The temple. And what happens at the temple? Everything having to do with worshiping Yahweh. Sacrifice everything else. Well, the northern kingdom can't even get down there anymore once they split up. So the first thing that uh, the Jeroboam, the first, the new king of the north, the first thing he does is set up two golden calves at two key locations and tell the Israelites, well, we can't, we can't worship Yahweh and the temple in Jerusalem anymore, so worship these golden calves. That was the start of it. From then on, every king of the north encouraged worshiping false gods. And that's the reason why God's judgment eventually in 722, using the Assyrian military, was destruction of the north. In the south, they had had some bad kings, but they had some good kings too. And they continued to try to come back to worshiping, you know, they, they have some bad kings, and a good one come along and try to reform uh, the southern kingdom of Judah and get them back online. Well, in 721, Assyrians, after completely destroying the northern kingdom just a year earlier, they come south. At that point, the king of the southern kingdom of Judah in Jerusalem was King Hezekiah. This is recorded in 2 Kings and in 2 Chronicles. Hezekiah was a good king. He really was trying to worship the Lord. He was trying to do the right thing. This was the time of the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah told Hezekiah, don't give in to the Assyrians. And they're going, like, what? <laughs> you just saw what their empire looked like. The Assyrian military was had had no match you know, prior to that. It was an astonishing. They were known for their cruelty. They were known for their viciousness and their military tactics. And so Isaiah says, God says, hold out, Hezekiah. And Hezekiah says, okay, if you and God say so, Isaiah. Well, what happened was, according to these passages of 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, an angel of the Lord smote the army of Assyria. 185,000 of them died outside the city walls of Jerusalem. And the Assyrians turned to go home. Later on, in the annals of victory, like the when the, uh, at this point, Tiglath-Pileser III has left and Sennacherib is the king now. Sennacherib's records of his great conquerors, uh, all of the cities he destroyed and all the enemies he defeated, he never claims to have defeated King Hezekiah. He says, I sacked, you know, I think it's 26 of their fortified cities, and when I got to Jerusalem, um, Hezekiah couldn't stand up to me, and so I trapped him like a bird in a cage in his own royal palace. He doesn't say he never he conquered him. All right, it's quite no. It's the first example of spin, political spin. I think in history. <laughs> doesn't say oh, I had to leave because 185,000 of my guys fell over dead. In fact, the King James, I believe, it's it's very kind of funny in one of these places where it says, "And the next morning, the Assyrian army awoke to find themselves dead." <laughs> Um, and so Sennacherib does not conquer the southern kingdom. And at, not too long after that, um, about, what are we looking at, 30 years later, the, north, the kingdom of Assyria falls. It falls to the Babylonians, which is the next big power. Now these two, the Assyrians, it's actually in both cases, both of them have been mighty powers that had declined and then come back. That's why you get Neo, which means new, the Neo-Assyrian Empire and the Neo-Babylonian Empire. This Neo-Babylonian Empire was, uh, was led by a king you've probably heard of, Nebuchadnezzar, who is the king in the book of Daniel that you read a lot about. So the Neo-Babylonian uh, Neo Empire was from, uh, really didn't last that long, it only it lasted less than 100 years, the Neo-Babylonians, but in its time, they were sufficient to defeat the Assyrians and do a lot of other damage. So, in 599, what, what you have going on here after the Assyrians are destroyed is the uh, Egyptian, in the north you've got the Assyrians and the Babylonians, down south you've got the Egyptians, and the Egyptians during the Assyrian Empire, etc., they were not at their, at their best, they had had stronger times. But during this time, the, Assyri the Egyptians start rising in power, and they start moving north, and they end up trying to do battle with the Babylonians. Well, 
little kingdoms like Judah, the little kingdom of Judah, they call on the Egyptians for help. And during a period of time here of about 60 years or so, um, different factions who are in control in the kingdom of Judah in Jerusalem, that one will side with Babylon over against the Egyptians, the other will side with the Egyptians against the Babylonians, and it goes back and forth. Then you have assassinations, and you have all that kind of stuff you see on NDR. Okay, Florida? And where were the Babylonians? Okay, <laughs> the Babylonians are very similar here. You'll notice it's a lot of the same land. They don't go as far north. But the Babylonian Empire, now again, to give you perspective, this was the Assyrian Empire, right here, okay? Well, the Babylonians defeated the Assyrians, which means they got most of the goods. They actually came further down into the Arabian Desert, although why you would want to control the Assyrians, I don't know. But they still, they controlled Egypt, they controlled all of Palestine, they went over a little further into the southern part of Asia Minor, and probably a little further over into what is modern day um, Iran. So again, this is Israel, this is, um, you know, Arabia, this would be um, Iraq, this would be Iran, this would be Turkey today. Okay? How did they come into existence? Um, well, they had existed as a culture since the dawn of time. Okay. This area here, this is the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. The area in between here is called Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia literally means the land between the rivers. And what happened was, this area, all down through here and down because of the Nile River, this is what's called the Fertile Crescent. Because the rivers made it naturally fertile. Wild um, wheat and other kinds of, of uh, food products that later were domesticated grew there wild, and that's where they were first domesticated. Cattle were first domesticated here. This is the birth of civilization. Writing happened there. The invention of the wheel happened there. You name it. Now, there were Mesoamerican cultures, you know, Middle America, like the starting with the Old Macs and some of the others in this part of the world. And there were ancient Chinese cultures. But this area was responsible for more of what we think of as the foundation of civilization than anywhere else. Well, the cities, for instance, Babylon, was the place where the Babylonian Empire first started. And this is Ur, Ur of the Chaldees. Uh, some of the oldest cities in the world were right here. Ur of the Chaldees, Chaldee is another word for Babylonian. Ur of the Chaldees was the home of Abraham. Abraham started out here when he was Abram. They went north with his father to Haran, which is where his father died, and then later they moved down into Palestine. Okay, So this area has been the center of civilization forever. Now. If you go back to the previous slide, Susa um, was the, the center of the Persian Empire. Nineveh, which we'll talk about in a minute, Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. So the Babylonians started here, the Assyrians started there, and they grew. Okay? All right. Now, um, I'm not going to spend forever on this, I promise you. So, the back and forth between the Babylonians and the Egyptians. And the little country, the, the, the nation of Judah, the nation of Israel and Oaks gone, the southern nation of Judah is there. Judah goes back and forth between the two. Well, finally, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, gets tired of being jerked around because these people, one week they're on our side, the next week they're on Egypt's side. So in 599 BC, Nebuchadnezzar takes his army down and they conquer Judah. No longer are they just a vassal state, no longer just a client state, they're called, which means they leave you alone as long as you pay taxes and stuff. Now they take them over, and they have the first deportation, which is where they take some of the Israelites and they take them off into captivity in Babylon. The prophet Ezekiel is one of the people in that first deportation. Then it still keeps going back and forth. The, the kingdom of Judah, every once in a while they think, okay, we think Egypt is strong enough now, so we're going to side with Egypt again, even though we've already been sort of conquered by Babylon. Finally, in 586, the Babylonians have had it up to here. They march into Jerusalem. They destroy the city of Jerusalem. They destroy the temple. And the second major deportation where they took people off into captivity. This is the one in which Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or as my wife heard 
when she was growing up, they told her it's shake a bed, make a bed, to bed we go. Uh, <laughs> the, the book of Daniel is all about these young princes taken off into captivity, and because they're young and bright and healthy and handsome, the Babylonians aren't stupid. They say, we're going to turn these people into, you know, into our guys. We're going to make them lieutenants of our nation. And so that's what the book of Daniel is all about, is Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and others of these Israelites taken off into captivity during, uh, into, into Babylon. This is the time of the exile. You will hear about the Babylonian exile. This is what this is, and it happened in the 500s. From 586 to 538, the Babylonian exile of the Jews. And then, in 582, there's a third deportation. During all of this time, Jer Jeremiah the prophet has been there. He's there, he's been warning the kings in the south, quit messing around with this stuff, you know, return to God, and God will judge you. After Hezekiah, Hezekiah was a good king. Hezekiah's son, Manasseh, was one of the worst. He undid all of the positive things Hezekiah had done. He's the one that started creating problems with the Babylonians and the whole thing. And so Manasseh, Manasseh was horrible. Manasseh dies. His his oldest son serves just for a very short time and dies, and then King Josiah comes along. King Josiah, the grandson of King Hezekiah, was probably one of the best kings the South ever had. The reforms of Josiah, he went through the country and tore down temple altars to Baal, tore down Asherah poles, had the law of the Lord, they actually refound the book of Deuteronomy, which had been lost, they found it in the temple, brought it back, he had it read publicly, he really instituted proper worship, Unfortunately, this back and forth between the Babylonians and the Egyptians, at one point the Egyptians marched north to fight the Babylonians, and Josiah, who had, they, we had a treaty with the Babylonians, and he was trying to honor it, he goes out to try to stop the Egyptians, and Josiah gets killed. Josiah's son is horrible. Josiah's second son gets put in place. He's horrible. The end is near. And so they eventually are completely destroyed by Babylon. But in that, again, Hezekiah... Hezekiah's grandson Josiah, two of those kings of Israel, and this is one of the reasons that they lasted 150 years longer than, than the northern kingdom of uh, Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah, they had people who were trying. You know, Hezekiah and Josiah were both really good kings, really good men. So, the third deportation. Now, Jeremiah the prophet has been there. He had been warning them about all this. He's there when the city is destroyed. He's there when the temple is destroyed. He remains in the city in the first two deportations. In the third deportation, a lot of people flee and head south into Egypt because they've been people who sided with Egypt, and they forced Jeremiah to go with them, and so he's taken off into Egypt. Okay, but you get this picture: the prophets, uh, the earliest prophets, start prophesying in the 700s, prior to the destruction of the Northern Kingdom of Israel. The last of the prophets, the post-exilic prophets, uh, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi prophesy after the exile as the people um, because what happens after this you've got the Assyrian kingdom destroys the north um, the northern kingdom of Israel the Babylonians come along they destroy the southern kingdom of Israel and carry the people up into captivity and then you get the Persian period after only about a hundred years uh, less than a hundred years of power for the Neo-Babylonian Empire Nebuchadnezzar and then his son and his grandson, Belopalazar, um, the Persian Empire from further east, the Medes and the Persians, okay? Um, Persians come in and without a drop of blood defeat Babylon. Babylon was decaying on the inside. Again, this is in the book. You remember the handwriting on the wall in, Bab in Daniel? Um, the king, Balapalazar, who is the grandson, we believe, of Nebuchadnezzar, it says, he calls him his father, but we believe he was a grandson, who is a horrible king, and just a wastrel. He's having a party with his, his friends and prostitutes, and, and he decides on a lark to call and get the, the uh, temple. They brought all of the gold and silver and everything from the temple in Jerusalem. He calls for it to be brought in so they can have a party with it, just to sort of make fun of the Jews who got defeated. Well, God didn't like that. And a hand appears and writes on the wall. Belopalazar can't read it. You've heard the handwriting's on the wall? That's where the expression comes from. This hand appears and writes on the wall. Nobody can interpret it. And somebody remembers that Daniel, who's now an old man, has miraculous ability to interpret dreams, which he did for Nebuchadnezzar, to, to do all sorts of interpretations. And Daniel always says, well, no person can interpret this for you. 
but the God of Israel, my God Yahweh, can. And then he interprets. Well, he comes in and he looks at this, and um, Belahalazar says, I will give you, you know, treasures and half my kingdom and everything else. He says, Keep your stuff, but I'll tell you what it says. It says, Tekel, Tekel, Mini Parsim, which means you've been weighed in the balance and found wanting, and your kingdom ends now. That night, the Persians defeated Babylon. They just sort of walked in, and nobody fought them because the king was so horrible. Um, and that's when, in 539, Persia conquers Babylon pretty much without a fight. The first king of Persia was Cyrus the Great. I've already mentioned. Let me get over here. Cyrus the Great has a very different idea from both the Assyrians and the Babylonians. Both the Assyrians and Babylonians, in order to keep people from rebelling once they conquered them, they would try to spread them out, put them into slavery, deport them, do all kinds of stuff. Cyrus's response, and the Persian Empire is as large as these others, you know, in its day, um, he says, instead of trying to oppress these people and spread them out, I'm going to be nice to them and maybe get them on my side. And so, not just the Jews, but other people, Cyrus announces that people can worship their own gods. And that if they've been displaced from their homes, they're free to go back. And so Cyrus has a decree that the Jews are free to return to Israel. Now, not many do, but over several different trips, 42,000 Jews return first under Zerubbabel and Joshua. And then later on, in the 450s BC, about 80 years later, Ezra leads more of the returnees back. Um, and he, Ezra, is a priest, and he begins to teach Torah, he begins to teach the law of God again. They work on rebuilding the temple. But when they rebuild the temple, they don't have any walls in the city anymore, and so they keep getting, bandits keep coming in. And so Nehemiah, prophet Nehemiah, is inspired by God, and he's working for the Persians. He go, he's an he's, um, assistant to the Persian king. He goes to the Persian king and says, can I go back? and rebuild the city, uh, the wall around the city so that the, the people, my people who have gone back there can be okay. And he said, sure, I'll make you the governor. And so he makes um, Nehemiah the governor. He goes back and rebuilds the walls of Jerusalem. And then you, in 430 BC, you get the last of the Old Testament prophets. Again, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi are the post-exilic prophets. They're the prophets that prophesy after 538 BC when Cyrus tells the Israelites they can go back home. Okay. Yes. Do we know how many Jews stayed in Persia? Almost all of them. Uh, I think there were fewer than 100,000 that returned at that time. Now, various other times down through history, Jews did return. Obviously, the big return was in 1948. Yes. Because the promise had always been. The Jewish people, the Jewish religion has a concept of salvation, but it's not the same one we have. The Jewish faith believes there will be a Messiah, that is the, the, the true, the, the, those who still have a faith. You know, many Jews have become very liberal, like a lot of Christians have. But those who still maintain a biblical faith in the, in, in the Jewish religion believe there will be a Messiah, they will believe there, there will be an afterlife, they believe that there will be a, you know, a day of redemption. Um, but their definition of salvation has always been return from exile. The Jewish idea of salvation has always been that we are allowed to return to the place God promised us from exile. This is why 1948 was such a big deal to Jewish people worldwide. It was the largest single example that the Jews were, and, and Scripture says that that will be one of the signs of fulfillment for the Jewish people, that they will be allowed to return to the Promised Land. Well, some of it happened here. There were other times in which there were kind of... Uh, re-immigrations of Jewish people into the homeland, uh, the Promised Land, but the largest single one was in 1948, you know, which is 24, 2,500 years later. And so obviously that's a big deal, um, and that's why the reestablishment of the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel is not a religious nation. The nation of Israel is a completely non-religious, secular nation. And so in that regard, it does not fulfill the idea that there's going to be a people of God in Israel. A lot of people confuse that. Uh, but the, the return from exile is the ultimate goal of the Israelites. It always has been. Okay. Questions about that? Can they regard that as their salvation? They, that's, their definition of salvation is to be able to go back home and to be able to stay there and to be free from oppression. And so a return from exile. You know, they believe in, in effect, heaven on earth. You know, that God will eventually someday 
reestablish under an heir to King David, that's the messianic expectation, they will reestablish a king over Israel, and that Israel will basically become the first of all nations, and that they will be given the freedom and protection to be able to live out their lives there. Okay? And one of the reasons why that's so important is everywhere they've been, they've experienced oppression. Exactly. Everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. There's never been a more oppressed people from the book of Esther on. Yeah. John? Just a comment. Um, talking about these prophets, and you're, you're painting a backdrop from which God rose these voices up to speak into this geopolitical morass of right. power and structure and so on. And you know, it, 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 one can look at this, and just by your examples today, see that these men, these men did not speak on their own, despite saying, this is the word of the Lord. You look at it, and like, you look, you said, Isaiah is telling Hezekiah, um, resist him, resist him, resist him, which is not a popular notion. And then, and Hezekiah and everybody else said, have you looked out there? <laughs> And so, and then you look late years later, Jeremiah is telling the king, surrender. And yeah. if you don't surrender, you'll die. So you have two different approaches there that, to me, bear witness that this is a word from God. And it's not controlled by the powers that be. <coughs> it's not for national security. Right. It, is, it is God speaking into that time. And that's, that's, uh, yeah. that's very powerful. And the reason for all of this background is so that you understand the context that they were speaking into. What they say doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless you get some idea what they were speaking to. Exactly. Um, and I'm going to give you a little bit of, of what their message was in just a second. But, um, yeah, and you, and you get this strange... The messages of the prophets are quite consistent with the exception of a few of the minor prophets. In fact, some scholars believe you should look at... that. There's a reason why the Jews kept the book of the Twelve, that is all twelve minor prophets together, is if you look at them as a whole, the message is completely, is completely consistent with Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and major prophets in terms of all the pieces being there. But you, you get, I mean, Jeremiah spent his whole life preaching God's word and was never accepted. He was rejected, he was humiliated, he was beaten, he was in prison. Jeremiah never got through, and he saw the destruction of Israel. Okay? And himself was taken off into, into exile in Egypt. Uh, and so you get Jeremiah spending his whole life doing this, and then you get Jonah, the little book of Jonah. Jonah... His ministry was not to the Israelites. His ministry was to Nineveh. You know, he was he, the Assyrians. Jonah was a prophet to Assyria, and he didn't want to go. That's why you know he ran for it, threw him overboard, big fish swallowed, thrown up on land, the whole thing. But Jonah, you know, after stomping his little feet and saying, "I don't want to," he finally goes to Nineveh. He preaches one sermon, and the whole city converts. <laughs> Jeremiah spent his whole life speaking to the Jews, the people of God. Nobody ever listened to him. Okay, and it's believed that Jonah, for instance, may be in the story of Jonah is God's plan, God's counterpoint. He's like, my own people will not listen to me. Let me show you what can happen when the word gets spoken to a foreign people. You know, because God is the God of all people. And yet, one servant and Jonah, they accepted so quickly and converted so wholly that Jonah was mad about it. Okay. <laughs> You know, I don't even like these people. <laughs> so it, it's it's a very uh, an interesting thing. Let me give you a little bit more information. We got about 13 more minutes. Okay, um, these are this is the list of the latter prophets or the literary prophets, the ones that wrote. Again, it doesn't mean they're the only important ones. Elijah and Elisha are about as important as anybody. And Moses, Moses did write, but you know he's the first of the prophets. But the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and as I said, we're including Daniel. Because Daniel's included in the list of major prophets in the Protestant canon, not in the Hebrew canon. And then the minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Now, there are dates here, there are descriptions of who they were preaching to and what their message was. All of this is available for you online. So I, I recommend you go on and look at this. Now, the earliest of the prophets, total earliest, were Hosea, Amos, and Jonah. Okay. Jonah may have been the earliest, and it may have been exactly for that reason God was trying to set an example for, you know, if a prophet's obedient, even after not wanting to be, um, you know, I, I can change hearts. So you get, again, they're not in order. This is the order there in the Bible. That's, that's not the chronological order. We don't know exact dates on some of them, but we've got circuits, and, and you see that. 
These are the literary prophets, the ones we're going to be focusing on in this class. Now, another way to look at that, in terms of the, the situation they spoke into, Assyrian dominance, Babylonian uh, dominance, and Persian dominance, those three great uh, empires. During the Assyrian dominance, when Assyria was um, taking over everything, before and during and after the time that they destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel, you've got Amos, Jonah, Hosea, Isaiah, Micah, Nahum, and Joel. Then, during, and that's 745 to 612 BC. Now, the next list, which is the Babylonian dominance, is 612 to, 630, to 539. Now, there's an asterisk by Jeremiah, because Jeremiah actually started his ministry 14 years before that, in 626, and was preaching for 14 years before Assyria was conquered by Babylon. But most of his preaching, most of his ministry, remember, he did this his whole life. Jeremiah was preaching God's word his whole life. Most of his focus was on preaching to the southern kingdom of Judah about the judgment that is coming by the hand of the Babylonians, by God's will, if they don't straighten up. So we, we list him under the Babylonian dominance, even though his ministry started 14 years before Babylon conquered Assyria. So you get under the Babylonian dominance, Jeremiah, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Ezekiel, Daniel, and again, Joel. Joel is a little, as one of the minor prophets, Joel is one of the ones that's a little confusing in terms of knowing how to, how to slot it. And then Persian dominance, which means post-exilic, after the Babylonians were, were conquered by Persia and the Jews were allowed to return, you get Daniel. Daniel actually is written during the time of the exile, you know, in, from Babylon, or at least that's the advance. It may have been written right after that. And then Zechariah, Haggai, and Malachi. Um, a chronology in terms of timeline, you can see up here, Assyria, and then there's some overlap when both were in, in ascendance, and then Babylon, and then a little overlap, and then Persia. Jonah and Nahum uh, preaching to Assyria. This is the timeline from 1000 BC to 400 BC. One of the, the first of the prophets were like Joel and Obadiah speaking to Edom. There are some of the minor prophets that don't speak to Israel. They speak to other nations like Edom and Moab, etc., or Nineveh. Uh, then the, the prophets to Israel in the north, Amos and Hosea, come along in the 700s. At the same time that Micah and Isaiah approximately are preaching to Judah, the southern kingdom. Israel, the northern kingdom, is destroyed in 721. And then you get to the southern kingdom of Judah, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, and Jeremiah preaching, you know, potential judgment if they don't straighten up. Then this gap is the period of time in which Judah was destroyed and the captivity in Babylon. You get Daniel and Ezekiel preaching. And then after the post-exilic, after Persia reconquers, you get Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So this gives you a timeline who they primarily were preaching to and who was in charge at that time. The spots, the dots here, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel are major prophets. Okay, does that give you a good, con a visual concept of who we're talking about and who they were talking to? Okay, this is another way of looking at it. I'm giving you so much stuff. Uh, I list here the major oral prophets, Elijah and Elisha. They're pre-literary. They didn't write any books. Um, they're prophesying to Israel. That's Israel as a whole. Okay. And other, you know, who was the king, what was the approximate date, and where were they born? Then you get the major literary prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Daniel is not on this because Daniel is that sort of weird sort of prophet, sort of apocalyptic, etc. And then the minor literary prophets. All of these, uh, Book of the Twelve, uh, who they preached to, who was king, what their years were, and uh, where they were born. Okay. Again, this resource is all available for you online. Questions about any of that? Don't say you don't have enough information. <laughs> okay, now, the message of the prophets. I want to spend the last 10 minutes talking about this. Um, the Old Testament prophetic books provide a crucial bridge of continuity, I believe, between God's message in the Old Testament and God's message in the New Testament, which is one of the reasons I did the prophets class now before I do uh, the, the history and writing stuff. Um, I mentioned this before, I think I mentioned this before, the Old Testament introduces two major story cycles. This is one way to think about what I said earlier. The first major story cycle, and both of these are, are addressed in the prophetic books. In fact, the prophetic books are the ideal place in which these two things are brought together in our understanding. 
The first is Genesis chapter 3 to chapter 11 presents the cosmic world, worldwide story of sin and separation. It affects everybody. This is before there was a Jewish people. There's just humanity made in the image of God, fallen from grace, separated from God. That's Genesis 3 to 11. That's the story of all humanity that has been carried out since then. Then Genesis 12 to 2 Kings 25 is about God's specific call and plan for Israel. For his chosen people, the Jews, starting with Abram, Abraham, and working through, you know, the, the whole history, captivity in Egypt, the exodus, the law, the judge, you know, entry into the promised land and conquering, the judges, the monarchy, the whole thing, okay? Um, now, the prophets specifically declare that the specific theological story of Israel, starting with Abraham, that that merges with the cosmic universal theological story of Genesis 3 to 11 into one spectacular restoration plan of God's. That God will restore, will bring Israel and all of the other nations together under a glorious and righteous Davidic Messiah. Jeremiah talks a lot about the fact that all nations of the earth will be blessed. As I told you, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, when God renewed the covenants with them, every time he says, and through you all nations of the earth will be blessed. The prophets are the most pointed place where the promised covenant to the Israelites and the promised redemption of all humanity are brought together. That's why you get Isaiah having all of these passages about the coming of a Messiah that would be for all people. That's why the suffering servant is described as providing redemption from the sins of for all people. And over and over and over again, Jeremiah talks about the time when it will not be the written law, but rather the law that is written on their hearts, that all men will know this truth. So the prophets are the place where these two great stories, the fall of all humanity, and the particular covenant expectations God has for the Jewish people, come together in one story, in the plan for, re for restoration, which we know that that restoration uh, reached its pinnacle. It's still to be worked out. It's already, but not yet the fulfillment found in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Okay? So this is the critical part of the message of the prophets, that Israel will be saved, humanity will be saved, or restored, perhaps is a better word, still by obedience, not just cavalierly, you know, it's not universalism, everybody's not going to be okay. There, is, there are requirements, but God has a plan by which that restoration can occur. Now, particularly, Understanding that that message, we can see the message of the Old Testament prophets summarized in three points. I told you that the covenant of God had three points. I will be your God, you will be my people, I will be in your midst. Well, likewise, the message of the Old Testament prophets, this is true for all of the major prophets, clearly true for some of the minor prophets, but as I say, some scholars say we should look at the minor prophets as one book, like the Hebrew Bible does, the book of the Twelve, because if you look at all of that as one narrative, in effect, then it completely fulfills this three-part message, or three points of the message of the prophets. The first message is you, Israel, Judah, Northern Kingdom of Israel, Southern Kingdom of Judah. You have broken the covenant of God, and you had better repent. You better shape up. This is serious stuff. You have broken the covenant agreement you have with the Lord and God of the whole universe, and you better straighten up. That's the first point. And that happens over and over and over again. Second, the message is no repentance. You're not repenting. All right, then judgment. Judgment will come on all nations. The Israelites first, but on all nations. Remember, judgment against the Assyrians. Assyria fell, Babylon fell, Persia fell. By the way, the Persians ruled only uh, from the uh, 500 until the 300s when uh, Alexander the Great basically kicked everybody backside. Um, and we left Greece and came around, and, and his big enemy was Persia. And so that was his big target, was to defeat the Persians, and he did. So, no repentance, then judgment. And the judgment will be for all nations. But third, and most importantly, there is still hope beyond that judgment for a glorious future restoration for both Israel and Judah, and for all the nations of the world. This is the message of the prophets. You better repent and follow God according to the covenant, if you don't repent, you're going to be judged. But even in judgment, there will be restoration for all those who are true. Now, we'll get into the details of this, but in terms of the indictment of, against the Hebrew people for their breaking the covenant, there are three key ways in which the covenant is identified in the prophets as being broken. 
First, by idolatry, worshiping other gods. Every prophet addresses idolatry over and over and over again. You are worshiping other gods. And they did. You know, Solomon uh, set up places to sacrifice to foreign gods because his wives convinced him to. And on and on. The second is social injustice, which in many of the prophets is considered just as bad as idolatry. As bad as worshiping other gods is to take advantage of the widow and the orphan and the foreigner in your midst to not care for those who have needs and are unable to address their own needs. This con the condemnation against social injustice of this kind is just as rigid as the condemnation for idolatry. Okay. And then thirdly, the reliance on religious ritualism instead of worship. When God talks about, I don't, how many bowls do you think I need from your pen before I'm going to think it's okay? The point is it's sacrifice. I don't want sacrifice. I want a contrite heart. You know, I want, I want repentance for your sin. Just sacrificing is not going to do it. So those three things, idolatry, social injustice, and reliance on religious ritualism instead of true worship, those were the three biggest things that were the core of the messages of uh, conviction that the prophets had against the people of Israel. Okay? Um, got a lot more stuff I could do, but I'm not going to today because everybody's tired. Um, and that's enough, I think. Questions about any of that? This is all just foundation. This is background. Starting next week, we will start looking first at the major prophets and then specifically at the, the most famous and biggest and probably most important of the major prophets, which is Isaiah. But any questions about that? Uh, Florette? Um, going back to Abraham and when he had Isaac and, I don't know if this is related, but he had Isaac and Ishmael. Was Ishmael any of that area of Assyrian or Babylon or where did he go? Actually, um, Ishmael was south. Okay, his people were Arabia, actually. In fact, it's the Arab peoples are descended from Ishmael. Ishmael was the father of 12 tribes, just like Jacob was later. I mean, you've got um, Isaac and Ishmael, and then Isaac's sons Esau and Jacob. But Jacob was the father of 12 tribes, the Semitic tribes of Israel. Ishmael became the father of the 12 Arabic tribes. So that's why both the Arab peoples and the Semitic people, the Jews, both uh, Jews and Muslims all call Abraham father because he was, it's, it's from Abraham that they're all descended. And Ishmael are the Arabic people. And so uh, many of the, the people of the Middle East that are, are Muslim or of Arabic descent and are Muslim, um, they come from Ishmael. In fact, they, the, the Muslims had changed the stories in the Quran, so that it was Ishmael that almost got sacrificed, um, not Isaac. Um, and so there's, there's a parallel there. And so in that, in those wars, was that the, the, the Muslim, the Arab people that were coming up against? No. No. They, 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 they were, were they were a minor, they were a minor, a minor power down south. Okay. okay. The Edomites were the descendants of Esau and the. Malachites, am I right there? I'll have to think about that. I believe were the descendants, you know, and then the Arabic peoples were descendants of, uh, of Ishmael. They were not major players in any of that. Okay. John? Um, those three categories, idolatry, social injustice, and reliance on religious ritualism, are not arbitrarily chosen. Though that's, that's seen throughout all the Old Testament that God speaks against those things and raises up a prophetic voice. And the New Testament and up through the 21st century. Exactly. And and my point being is that those three things still set the foundation for such a voice to be to be raised up and speak within yeah. our generation because those three things exist today. Yeah, it's been rightly said that whatever you think about most is your God, and that is idolatry. The fact that we're, you know, we have more wealth and more resources than any time any people in history, and yet we have horrible problems with hunger and lack of education and lack of clean water and lack of medicine. And the fact that most people think if they show up for an hour on Sunday morning that they're good. Yeah, exactly. That's what this is. That's why the prophets are so important for us. Okay, thank you all, everybody. I hope that you all will try to make it to our class on the early church in the book of Acts tomorrow. And uh, God bless you all.